Sports CEO was just on TV and he made some really sensible statements, but also some really silly and ridiculous ones. Now, we Tesla stock investors want to pay attention to what Ford is doing because they will be competing if we can even describe what Ford is doing as competing. Let's take a look. Now, we talked to CFO, your CFO, John Lawler. Yes. And he broke down the, the longer term operating margin for that EV business at 8%. Now, I got a question. Well, Tesla's uh, at double digits. Why is that the case? Well, Tesla hasn't had any competition until Ford and others came along. Now their prices are down like $7,000 in one year. We need to clarify a few things here. By Ford and others, we should really say snails and turtles. They are moving very fast for turtles and snails indeed. Number two. Tesla had 64% of a US EV market share. If the EV industry was already developed and if one company had that big of a share, that would be considered a monopolistic practice. The difference here though is Tesla wanted others to come into the market, but no one really did. And so Tesla had to charge absolutely ridiculous prices for the wait times not to be even more absurd. When he says Tesla dropped prices, what I hear is the prices dropped from outrageous prices to somewhat reasonable prices now. And that has been the goal this whole time. There's going to be more price competition, you know, in that market. And we're counting on that. When we say 8%, you know, it won't be at the prices we see today. He's talking about 8% margins for 2026 just from the EV business alone. And I wish him luck. Hopefully they get there, although that will be very difficult. But Ford's transparency is so much better compared to GM's hubris. I think Ford has a better chance than GM here. However, one thing that sort of concerned me a little bit they increased the dividend while they need to transition to EVs. So you are paying money out to investors, but you are not transitioning that fast. Well, now they picked up the pace, but this is going to be painful. Their whole future depends on this transition and returning money back to investors. That may not turn out to be the best decision. Maybe do it a few years from now, once you are making money from EVs. And what we have to do is we have to design the truck differently. We have to scale with a plant like Blue Oval City here in Tennessee. We're going to have to have a more efficient distribution with no inventory, online, you know, uh, configuration. You can buy the vehicle and, and configure it online. And then we need to, you know, we need to have a different manufacturing process with, with uh, less labor content in the vehicle. When we do all those things, we'll make uh, an 8% margin. If it was today, we'd make more than 8% because uh, there's not as much pricing competition as I know there will be. His reasoning is pretty good here. I have to say that. And of course, they are trying to move away from the dealer network, which will help their profitability. And he does get it that they need to design a car from the ground up, specifically to be an EV. You cannot just take a gasoline car and just convert that into an EV without redesigning the whole car from the ground up. What are you seeing in the market right now for EVs? So all of your EVs have gotten really, really high marks, but you have a Tesla out there now cutting prices. What has been your response? What are you seeing in the marketplace? Before he says anything, let's just double check what is actually going on. Ford dropped prices for the Mustang Mach-E as soon as Tesla dropped prices. And last year, Ford's margins increased for EVs from 28.8% to now 40.6%. Keep in mind, these are negative margins. This was before the outrageous Tesla price cut. So what do you think is going to happen this year? I am very curious to see their further reporting. Yeah, it's an interesting, uh, interesting dynamic. You know, the market is actually changing more than we expected, but that's a good thing. By changing more than they expected, I think what they really mean is that, oh, it turns out people do want EVs, which are also actually better vehicles, especially if you make a good EV. And when others come to the market, Tesla does not just sit there doing nothing, keeping outrageously high prices. No, they 
lower these prices from absurdly high to reasonably overpriced. There is still room for Tesla to drop prices, especially as Tesla improves the technology. Although really, when you compare Tesla vehicles to equivalent gasoline vehicles, the prices, of course, are lower already. If you take into consideration the whole lifetime of the vehicle, However, compared to where Tesla is going to be years from now, I would still say Tesla's prices today are preposterously high. Unless you are the number one choice in the market and you are the leader and you are leading the market, I can't see how everyone dropping prices is good for Ford. That is just sugarcoating. For Tesla, it can be good because when Tesla drops the prices, everyone else suffers a whole lot more. However much you think Tesla suffers, everyone else suffers at least twice as much, three times as much, 10 times as much maybe, because now, earlier, they had a chance, oh, yeah, uh, maybe we can eventually become profitable. Oh, uh, we thought 2026 was possible for us to get to 8% margins. Now, mm, we may need to reconsider if Tesla drops prices again by a lot and when Tesla releases the $25,000 vehicle. First of all, we have really no competition for Lightning and, and E-Transit. Uh, both are best in, in van and truck in their segment electric and, and we haven't cut or adjusted prices at all. Well, watch out because the Cybertruck is coming. Also, Tesla indirectly revealed that they are working on a van of some sort. Uh, on the Mach-E, the Mustang Mach-E that competes with the Model Y, you know, our sales continue to go up. We've had adjusted prices down, but we also have a new affordable battery coming for the Mustang Mach-E, and we're now doubling production, uh, and, and that's starting to hit our showrooms now. With every vehicle sold, you lose 40%, and then you reduce the prices, so you can sell more of them. That's a good thing, as he said. Of course, you need to get to economies of scale, and that is really the only way to do it. It's just very painful to get through that. And for Ford, it is going to be difficult, but maybe they can pull it off. Uh, the demand is really strong for us. And the losses are even stronger. It is not the case for everyone, though. A lot of other EVs aren't selling. So I think, like always, it comes down to the best product wins. And I'm sure glad we're paying to our strengths. I tried a Mach-E, and while it is not a terrible car, if you try a Model Y, there are not many reasons to go to the Ford instead of the Model Y. In fact, it is difficult to come up with any logical reasons, really. Sentimental reasons, sure, you can find many, but really rational and logical reasons, not really. You know, Mach-E is a Mustang. <laughs> a transit, a, you know, transit's a, a van. We do really well. And people love Ford trucks. So we're just playing to our strengths. We think that's the right move. Yeah, they are trying to do as well as they can with what they got. It is going to be a struggle. You got to play to your strength. You got to you got to go after segments, even if they're new customers, for things that you know really well. Like our, you know, Lightning will power your house for three days. It's got a huge trunk. You know, those are things that the Challenger brands didn't really know about because they don't know the customers. The other thing is you got to organize differently. You need focus. These are new businesses. You can't use your prejudice of the past. I could give you a thousand examples like our wiring harness on the Mach-E. It's 1.6 kilometers longer than it needs to be because we, we used our internal combustion engine engineering standards for that wiring harness. But in electric, it, all that math changes with that heavy battery. So you need to set up a separate business with more focus. That's what Livewire is doing. That's what we're doing Model E. And, and I think that's the only way to reinvent the company like we're doing. You have to approach it as a startup. He is actually making real sense here. Although they are still paying out a dividend. They may need some of that money because these losses may get even bigger than they think they will be. Well, batteries are the constraint here. It won't be the manufacturing site behind me uh, and 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 the lithium-ion batteries that we use um, both lithium and nickel are really the key constraining commodities we normally get those from all over the world from south america to africa to indonesia and southeast asia 
We want to localize that here in North America, not just the mining, but the processing the materials. Actually, even if they're mined, let's say in the U.S. nickel, most of it is sent back to China to get processed. So the big change is going to be to onshore all that capability of processing, but also mining back here in the U.S. It'll be a huge job, just like it has been for semiconductors. And this is where the $7,500 EV tax credit comes into play. I think this tax credit doesn't really make much sense just to speed up the EV adoption. It is going to happen anyway, and it is going to happen pretty fast. But for geopolitical reasons, I think it does make a whole lot of sense for the US to actually do this, because like he just said, all of the uh, lithium processing for the most part actually happens in China and US and the US and China currently, the relations are not exactly great. I mean, they just met and they are talking about a change that has not happened in a hundred years that, that they both think is happening now. So yeah, I think that's roughly the right move for the US. Can you get the materials you need, batteries, workers, to achieve your electric vehicle goals? And, and what are some of those goals? Yeah, we're, we're going to build, I mean, we build about 5 million vehicles around the world at Ford. We're going to build an extra 2 million with our EV business. That's why we call Model E a startup, because we're going to grow the company's revenue by 30 or 40 percent. And we're already number two in EV in the U.S. Most of the customers are new to us. So this is a growth business. We have to get these materials from around the world until we localize the supply chain, which is what we want to do. By the end of this year, we'll secure all the raw materials to make the two million batteries by 2026 that we're going to need to go in our vehicles. Uh, so we're, we should be in good shape here. A lot of other companies are going to have to hustle to get that. But we're in good shape because we've been working on it for a couple of years now. Currently, they build 5 million vehicles. They think that they will be able to still keep building that many vehicles, that many gas-powered vehicles. I think that is not going to turn out to be accurate. In fact, I believe to really be convinced that is going to be the case will turn out to be ridiculous. Look at Norway's transition. And right now, we have much better EVs, by the way, than before, and US and the US is offering these huge tax credits as well. These manufacturers will not be able to keep making that many gas-powered vehicles as they did before. It may just take a while for them to figure that out. And this is the Tesla stock buying opportunity explained by Elon Musk. My name is Matt Posius. Like and subscribe if you haven't yet. And I will see you in the next video. Thank you so much for watching.